Yeah, um, praise the Lord. It'll be 49 years this July um, since I received the Holy Spirit. So that was back in 1973. Um, actually, when Bob and I got married back in 1970, uh, 1965, um, his best friend decided he'd open grace over to Australia in search of a new life. And um, he found a new life, but he found it in the Lord. And then um, a number of years later, he came back over here with his wife and um, came to our house one evening to um, tell us about what had happened to him. And um, they were things I was never being interested in God, although I believed there was a God. And I wasn't a person that was into the world, into drinking and smoking and all that. So what he told us was sort of quite interesting. But um, because we had four young children, we had a busy working life, Bob and I, so we had to balance our work and I said I had to go out to work while he was in the middle of telling Bob all about what had happened but anyway when I come home Bob told me a bit more so I think it was about a week or so later um, when I came home from work I knew something different um, had gone on in our house and it was Bob had received the Holy Spirit and um, he started to tell me all about what happened to him so we um, once again, being busy with four young children, I didn't have much time to sort of seek for the Lord myself. But then one Saturday, he decided to take all the kids off to their nans. So I had the whole day to myself. And I thought, this is the day I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit. And I did. Very quiet, very peaceful experience for me. But um, I knew what I had was from God. So praise the Lord for that. And I think it was about two weeks later, his friend come back and baptised us both by full immersion. So that's where my life in the Lord um, started. Well, over the, um, those 49 years, the things the Lord's um, done for me and my family has been incredible. And um, although Stan spoke about healing, he didn't sort of emphasise on it. So I think our, our first real major healing was our daughter of six months old. Um, was really sick and ended up in hospital with meningitis. But as it took hold of her so badly, they said that she wouldn't pull through it. And um, I just remember thinking to myself, oh, she will pull through it, because the Lord will look after her, and he did. And so praise the Lord for that. And over the years, by itself, I've had oh, loads and loads of healings. Um, I was healed from, I think Bob was trying to kill me off, actually, buying me these plants. But I ended up in hospital really, really um, ill. But the Lord healed me while I was in hospital. And um, one of our boys was given a new kidney from the Lord, which is just, you know, incredible. And um, that same son, over the last four years, um, was saved from death after having two major brain hemorrhages. And uh, the Lord's blessed him and looked after him all through that, to the point now that he's, all his brain stopped bleeding now, so he's been healed by the Lord. And uh, as I say, my own self, I've been healed um, from a heart attack. Um, had a mini stroke. Over the last 18 months, the Lord's protected me twice when I ended up in hospital with blood clots on my lungs and I was told that they could have been fatal. So um, I just praise the Lord and he's, you know, made absolute loads of provisions for us over those years. And um, I was just talking to Yana there and saying, um, you know, you just look at the world today and think, boy, you know what I mean? I'm really glad I've got the Lord. And I think it's, you know, Everybody should have the same as us, so yeah, just praise the Lord for everything he's done. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning all. Good to see everybody. Welcome here. If this is the first time you've been here, you're welcome here. Uh, we're going to have a look in the Bible today. We'll start in the book of James in the New Testament. It's going to be a lively Sunday school this morning. I wish I could go to Sunday school. It looks like it's going to be good fun in there today. Yeah. Um, a very good, um, we had a very good day yesterday. The, the boys had a good day. I don't know what the girls did, but the boys were very, we did a, a very, very spiritual shooting each other all morning. It was very, very uplifting. And uh, nobody died and nobody ended up in the hospital. So we're, we're giving thanks for that. Um, the thing on the news, something you can't get your, um, if you listen to the radio or the turn the telly on, uh, there's a word that you can't get, you, you can't get away from. I went to the, um, I, was, I went to the Asda the other week to put air in my tyres, right, in my car. And uh, I went to put the air in my tyres and it wouldn't work. You know, the, the air thing, yo, the air wasn't going in the tyres. And then I looked and it said it wanted 50 pence to do it. 
That, and I was thinking, that used to be free, that. And now it's 50 pence. So I said to Ronnie, I said, you know what, Ronnie? I went, I went to the garage to put the air in my tyres. And I dad wanted me to pay to put it in. And Ronnie said, that's inflation, that is. You know what I mean? And um, in, inflation is a, is, a, is a word that's in the, in the headlines. Uh, Ronnie reckons he's put three pounds on last week because of inflation. Goes on you, Ronnie. He uh, needs to be putting the weight on, doesn't he? Inflation is something that is of less value than it was before. That's what, I don't know how it all works. But don't ask me all that, by the way. Uh, economics, I give the money to Flair and she can work it out. Um, but what it means is, uh, what the money that you've got in your pocket now, it'll cost you maybe much more to do the journey that you were doing two or three months ago. So it's worth less. It's worth less. Whatever you've got is worth, it, it won't get you the same amount. That's what inflation is. Uh, adds up to, doesn't it? I'll tell you the thing about inflation and I'll tell you the thing about news, right? Give thanks today for what you've got. Give thanks today for what you've got. If, if, the, if, you, if you listen to this all day, every day, this is going up, that's going up, there's war in Ukraine, the grain's going to be, this is going to be, blah, 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 blah. You know, it will bring you a type of fear. It will bring you a type of anxiety. It's not to say that these things are not possibly uh, going to be happen. You know what the remedy for that is? Thank, thank your God today for what you've got. That's the remedy. Be thankful today. Uh, we've got plenty, you know what I mean? It's not so bad. Yeah, we've got houses to live in, beds to sleep in. Uh, you know what I mean? We're across the road, maybe uh, some people haven't. Going off on a tangent already, aren't I? James chapter 1. James chapter 1. He's going to talk a little bit about money today uh, in, a certain, in a certain way. Uh, James 1. Verse 3, knowing this, the trying of your faith, the trying of your faith works patience. And we're going to have a little look at this subject when things are tried. And often when, when the Bible uses this terms, it's talking about um, fire. So it, it talks about when, when gold is put through fire. If you, if you want to make something purer, you put it through fire and the, the impurities are skimmed off the top. And what's left is less, but it's purer. It's of more value. And it talks about the trying of your faith. Uh, and the thing about faith is, um, it's faith that endures. It's not just faith for today. You can think of the sower and the seed. As soon as the sun came up, it was withered away. And it's faith uh, that endures that the Bible's ta talking about. And it says in verse, um, verse, it says, uh, verse 11, it says, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass. And the flower thereof falls, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also the rich man fades away in his way. So he's talking about a certain type of riches, a certain type of thing that people may uh, hold to be valuable in this life. Uh, as soon as the light comes, as soon as light comes upon it, or a bit of heat comes upon it, it's gone. It's gone. And, uh, you know, certain things cannot stand the light because the light shows whether things are true or whether they're not true. And uh, it says in verse uh, 12, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, and this is what I want to look at today, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that, look to, to, to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. It's an important little principle, really. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. The word tried, uh, um, it says, uh, though it be tried uh, with fire, when he is tried, he will receive a crown of life. This word tried, we were talking yesterday, and uh, it's, it, the, the word in Greek is dokimos, okidoki, dokimos. And uh, dokimos was given a name. Uh, the dokimos, it means to be tested and to, to stand, to be able to withstand a test. And it means to be approved. It stands up to test. It stands up to, anything that's true will stand up to scrutiny. Um, uh, when, when you're telling the truth, you welcome scrutiny. You say, come and ask any question you like. It's wide open. It's wide open because it's true. When something isn't true, it's a little bit, a little bit elusive. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because it's not going to stand up 
And uh, this word, this word, uh, yeah, I've got it written down here. This word, dokimos, about coins. Uh, you find me the other bit of paper. Here you go. So coins, so 600 to 550 BC, that's when they can trace. There was probably coins a little bit before that, but this, it was the Greeks that really brought in uh, coinage, and that's called the drachma. They call that the, the drachma uh, coins. And then, you know, we can see that, that after the, um, the Roman Empire comes on the scene, and they have a thing called uh, the denarius. The, you know, you can read about that. They were silver. And... Um, what would happen? They were made out of gold or they were made out of silver originally. And it was the value of the coin. So there was that much, that amount of gold would be in the coin or that amount of silver uh, was in the coin. And what people would do, they would shave off. They would shave off a little bit of silver or a little bit of gold from around the edge. And that devalued the whole currency. That's what it does. But that little bit that they were shaving off was for them. So they could have a bit, you know, to, to increase themselves. So to increase themselves, they were taking away from the whole, which is a bad system. So if everyone starts shaving these little coins, and the dokimos in Greek were people who would not shave the coins. They wouldn't shave them. They, no matter what, you could trust these fellas. If you were going to the dokimos and you were dealing with them, you were going to get the full value of the coin. Uh, uh, that's what it means. They'd shave them. They'd shake. There was, there was a thing called shaking. They'd put them in a bag and shake them and bits would fall off them. That was another way they called that sweat. And there was another thing where they would, uh, they would take, they would take um, bits out of the coin and add uh, non-precious metals into the coin. Again, to, to, all these different ways to devalue the coin. In, in Rome, in Rome after the first... Oh, the other thing is, when the Caesars come in, when the Caesars came in, uh, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, that's when they started putting the emperor's head on the coin. They'd stamp his head on the coin. So where, wherever you went, you'd see his face. You, you, you would see his face. So hit the face of the emperor would be in your mind. And the face of it, the emperor was, was, was then associated with value as well. It's, a bit of a, it's quite clever stuff when, when you get into it. But anyway, adding to or taking away from devalues the currency. Adding to, so if you shave it off, you're taking away. If you're putting a little bit of non-precious metal in, after you've took your bit of silver out, that's taken away, isn't it? Adding to or taking away uh, devalues the country. Uh, in, in the third century, the denarius started off at nearly 100% silver. If you got a denarius around Julius Caesar's time, it would nearly be 100% silver. By the third century, there would be 2% of silver left. Well, we've got, a, we've got a visitor, Mickey Mouse. Yeah. So if you're a bit nervous, if you're a bit nervous... You know what I mean? Don't worry, we've got, a, we've got a mouse at the front. We've got an intruder. They shall, they shall take up mice. He's gone. Where's he gone? Yeah, he's interested, yeah? Yeah. He'll be all right. He's only little. There you go. See you later. That was exciting, wasn't it? Uh, if, 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 you, if you're scared of him, think about what we look like to him. You know what I mean? He'd be terrified of us. Anyway, little mouse. Throw him out. Where is he? Mark, throw him. Get him by the car and throw him out. Disrupting the meeting. Uh, yeah, so from 100% pure, nearly pure silver to 2%, you know what I mean? But you still think you've got the same coin, but it's valueless. It's valueless. Still got his head on it. People are still trying to trade. So it just shows you how things... That's called, that's called uh, debasement. The debasement. Um, anybody will, will have seen... You might have seen... Um, I remember when I, was, when I was little. I always remember this, this image on the telly. And it was a picture of a man in, in Germany during the war, in the Second World War. And right at the end of the war, um, when things had gone wrong for, for Germany, he had a wheelbarrow full of banknotes. Yeah, million mark notes. He had billions of marks in this wheelbarrow. And the man on the film said, the wheelbarrow is worth more than the money. The wheelbarrow. So there's loads of it, but it's, it's worthless. It's worthless, devalue the currency. Now, we're going to start looking at, like, the word of God is, is the currency. The word, and people will add to the word of God. People will take away from the word of God. And if you carry on doing that, that devalues the currency of the word of God. And it has no value anymore. It devalues uh, God's word when it's mis, uh, misused and misrepresented. Uh, um, yeah, he, he goes on there to say, 
There's, there's, a, there's a little thing of a pattern there where he says here, let no man say when, he's, when, he, when he is tempted that he, he's tempted of God. God does not. The tempter is the other fella. The one who's doing the tempting uh, to, to, to entice you away to do something evil is a fella called the devil. Don't talk too much about him in there. You don't have to worry too much about him. If you're born again, the devil's beat, you know. Um, God is not in the business of tempting people, but he will allow you to be tried. He will allow you to be tried. And being God allowing somebody to endure trial and God tempting somebody is a completely diff there's a difference between the two. We need to understand that so we can understand what's going on sometimes. Because sometimes you don't understand why something is happening. If you think about uh, uh, Job, he thinks God's doing it to him when it's the devil. You know, so it, it's important that we understand uh, that point, the, the difference. And then you've got a little pattern. Lust conceives, brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. That's the way it goes. You know, uh, back, back to the garden. I mean, do not hear my beloved brethren, he's saying. And uh, every good and perfect good. God doesn't change. Uh, God is, God's, God's word doesn't change. His Bible doesn't change. He's ever faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. All, all the promises that Jesus has made in the New Testament are in force today while it's called today. The Holy Ghost is available today. Healing is available today. Anything that God has promised, and you meet him by faith on a personal level, uh, that's in force today. Nothing's finished. Nothing's finished. Uh, the New Testament is in force forced today. You know, he's consistent, he's faithful, he's reliable. And nothing else in this world is. So we do well. The righteous run into the name of the Lord. We do well to put all our eggs in that basket, all your trust, all your confidence into the thing that's never going to change and never going to be moved. That's the word of God. That's what it is. Uh, we didn't always have this uh, regard for it. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, back into the Old Testament. Have a look at a, a bit of a weird picture as well here. The children of Israel are in, in captivity. And uh, Babylon was the greatest um, empire upon the face of the, the earth at that time. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the world, basically. Uh, Babylon represents religion. Mixture, it means to confuse by mixing. Remember what we were saying? We take some of the, the precious silver out and put some alloys in. They look silver, but they're not silver. And we put them, we'll mix it up. We'll mix it up. So if you start to put things in to mix things up. And uh, Babylon's like that. It, it kind of represents that. Uh, Non-precious metals. Anyway, uh, Daniel chapter 2, in verse, go from verse 30, I think. Yeah, verse 30. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Nobody can interpret the dream, and it's troubled him. And he calls for Daniel. And Daniel's able to interpret the dream. And he says, as for me, this is Daniel talking to Nebuchadnezzar, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes, they shall make known the interpretation to the king um, that you might know the thoughts of your heart. This is the way it works. Uh, God is a revealer of things. God is a revealer. You, you pray about something for long enough and he'll, sh he'll shed his light upon it. He'll shed upon it, his, his light upon it. Um, you know, and he, what he's saying is, it, no, Daniel, Daniel is um, going to be like a vessel to show Nebuchadnezzar something. He said, but I, I'm not, I'm not, it's not special about me. It's the Lord who's doing the, the revealing, not me. I don't really know very much. And the Lord can use people. He can use children. He can use children. Uh, we, we have children who are spirit-filled, who are very, very young, and they can say things that re reveal something that's in your life. You know what I mean? He can use, which, he, he, you know, he can use a donkey to tell a fellow what to do. You know what I mean? So, so the, the Lord can use any vessel in which he chooses uh, uh, to, to, to reveal something to somebody. And it says, Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image, the great image whose brightness was excellent stood before you, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part clay. And you saw till a stone that was cut without hands smote the image upon his feet, 
uh, and the, that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and it became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that there was no place found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream and we will tell you the interpretation uh, thereof uh, before the king. So he didn't just tell him what the interpretation of the dream was. He told him what the dream was. And uh, you see this depreciation, gold. Is, gold is more valuable than silver, isn't it? Silver is more valuable than brass, isn't it? Brass is more valuable than iron and clay, isn't it? And it's this devaluing. It's the devaluing. This is a prophecy of the kingdoms that are going to come upon the earth. Never can, he tells him, you, you're the head of gold. The, get your history book out. The Babylonian Empire was, was followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, Cyrus and Darius, and it says they, they were the next ones down, and, and they were worth a little bit less. Then the next one is Alexander the Great, he's the Greek. Then there comes the Romans, and somewhere in, in today's world, uh, the remnants of the Roman Empire is, is in force somewhere upon the face of the earth today before the stone who's Jesus Christ comes and knocks it all down uh, and his kingdom becomes established uh, in the earth. Uh, and what, if you think about that, as, as mankind has gone through time, uh, the currency is getting devalued. They take things away and they add things in. There's like, you know, we, we've, uh, you, think, you can think about science, mathematics, philosophy, uh, Greek stuff and all the rest of it. It's good stuff, isn't it? It educates you, it can advance you, you know what I mean? But as we go along, now uh, we, we come down the statue in the age that we live in, people can't tell you what's right and wrong anymore. They can't tell the difference between right and wrong. What's the value of that currency? What's the value there? And it's devalued. And it's just like this prophecy, that's the way the world is going to be. And there's going to be lust, there's going to be sin, and then the sin's going to bring death. And in this, in this, in this uh, world that we live in, where everyone's got everything, there's much more of everything. We've all got everything now, haven't we? Money for nothing and your checks for three. Uh, microwave oven and a colour TV. Everybody's got everything and everybody. Where's, where's honour? Where's morality? Where's liberty? Where's truth? Where's natural affection for your neighbour? Where is it? Everybody's got everything. And the things that count are not there anymore. The substance of things is not there. It's not, not, not worth anything. Uh, anymore it's the, the, the currency is being devalued you know uh, as we go along and it seems to be uh, fit the pattern uh, Daniel chapter 3 we'll carry on with Daniel Daniel chapter 3 Um, yeah, and uh, so now Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar now sets up another image, just a, a golden image because it takes his fancy. And he says in verse four, uh, then the herald cried aloud, uh, to you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages. So this is a universal, this is a universal advertisement, isn't it? That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbolt, the psaltery, the dulcimer and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image. You've got to fall into line. Whoever you are, you've got, to, you've, got to fall, you've got to bow down. And whoso falls not down and worships the same, the same hour will be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the corn of the flute and all their instruments, the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden images, uh, that, the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had, had set up, except for Meshach, Shadrach, and Abadnego. These troublesome Jews who believed in the Bible and believed God, they wouldn't bow down. They wouldn't compromise. And Nebuchadnezzar is, 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 um, Nebuchadnezzar is cross with them because they won't dance to the tune. And if you don't dance to the tune, if you, if you, if you will not say uh, the things that everybody else says, you're going to be unpopular. You're going to be unpopular and uh, I, I, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable if you carry on believing in this God of the Bible. Yeah, that's the world that we live in today, you know. And um, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't change your stance and join in with us, I'm going to put you in the fire. I'm going to, I'm going to turn the heat up on you. 
I'm going to make you feel very uncomfortable in school, in the workplace or wherever it might be. Uh, that's the kind of analogy that we can take out of it today. And in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and his fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He brought them before the king and Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said to them, is it true uh, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? If you be ready at what time you hear the sound of all these instruments of music, you fall down and worship the image which I've made well, but if you worship not, I'll be, you'll be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that will deliver you out of my hands? I tell you what, compromise and I'll let you off. Say, say that this, you know, you know, come away from your, your Bible belief and join in with us and I'll let you off. I don't think he would anyway. Um, and people will be like that. If you just shut up and don't talk about God anymore and don't talk about what the Bible's got to say, we'll be your friend. And, uh, you know, we, we won't torment you. And uh, we won't call you a name or, you know, a uh, kind of thing. And um, it says in verse... Uh, so but basically they say, verse 22, uh, they say, well, even if you threaten me, even if you threaten me, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not going to compromise. I will not compromise. You know, and uh, people basically will threaten you to compromise uh, your faith in what God says is right and what God said is wrong. That's the kind of pressure uh, that you're under. Anyway, in verse 22, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men which took up Shadrach, Mishnech, and Abednego. They, 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 they heated it seven times hotter than it was before, didn't they? It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, these people are hot. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is angry. He's cr very cross with these people who, 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 who won't give up on the Lord, you know. And uh, the people who are throwing them in are the people who get burned with the fire. And this is what you find. When people have bad fire inside them and that they want to, you know, send their bad fire your way, if you're faithful, you know, the fire will consume them and not you. You know, and keep away uh, uh, from bad fire. And it says, uh, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the fairy, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and he rose up in haste and spoke unto the counsellors. Didn't he cast three men into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hair. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Uh, listen, uh, if, if you believe by faith and you stand up for the Lord by faith and talking about now, uh, the Lord will turn up. The Lord will turn up in your trial and he, he will, he, he, people, people will see the Lord. Uh, but the, the nervous part is, is before he just turns up when you're saying, no, I, I won't compromise. Uh, but the Lord turns up in the midst of this trial. And... Uh, 27, it says in verse 27, he says, And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counsellors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire, the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were the coats changed, and the smell of the fire passed on them. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, eh, that they might not save nor worship any god, except uh, their own God. And this is what trial, the trial of your faith in a picture term um, is like. Uh, bad fire has no power over truth. Hatred, um, any other type, type of fire that you can think of, the fiery darts of the wicked, it has no power over truth. Uh, and that's where we put our confidence. We walk uh, in the truth, by faith, in sincerity, in the love of God, right, and whatever fire comes your way will not burn you. It'll burn the ones who want to burn you, but it will not burn you. Uh, that's, a, that's a great comfort, uh, uh, really, to know. Uh, and there's a testimony, you know, the, the testimony that the, the king sees and he changes his mind and he says, oh, <laughs> I, think we, I think we should be over here with these fellas because they've got faith and their God turns up, you know, and he starts to praise the Lord. Uh, and this is the way things work, you know, um, you, might f you might feel that you're the only one sometimes uh, standing up for the Lord and standing up by faith. And it takes a bit of guts, it does. It, takes a bit, it can be quite uncomfortable uh, when people are not 
you know, uh, kind towards you or thinking well of you. you know, when you stand up for the Lord and he'll stand up for you and, and the testimony is people will see the Lord and they'll be thankful. They'll be sitting, they'll be sitting here uh, or sitting in the waters of baptism or filled with the Holy Spirit because you stood your ground. You stood up uh, for the Lord. We stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. He stood up for us at Calvary, didn't he? And if you think about this uncomfortable business, but just remember what the Lord, how uncomfortable the Lord would have been at Calvary or in Gethsemane. And think how uncomfortable that is before we start thinking, oh, you know. Um, anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians, back into the New Testament now. Just a couple more scriptures. 2 Corinthians. Dokimos, Dokimos, they were approved, weren't they? They, wouldn't, they weren't shaving the coins. They weren't willing to give in. Um, they weren't willing to compromise on, on their belief. And that added value to the currency, didn't it? That adds value. So when people are faithful and when people are honest and sincere with the word of God, walking in the spirit, we would call it in here, you know, that adds value to the currency. So where, where God's word is being devalued in, in other places, uh, you know, uh, for this cause, the way of truth is evil spoken of, it says in the New Testament. When you stand up and you're a good testimony, uh, you know, that adds value uh, to the word of God. Uh, here's something for you. If, if, you're baptized, if you're born again, right, and you're walking in the spirit, you're golden. You're golden. Uh, you know, if you're honest and you go about your work properly and you're respectful uh, and you're a good testimony and you do things as unto the Lord, any employer in the land is one that employ you. You become golden. So talking about gold being refined, uh, you know, uh, you're very valuable to employers that work two ways that one. But it's worth noting. Anyway, Second Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, further on in time, this, this, this shaving of the coins... This kind of went on for years and years and years. And the father who really nailed it was a man called Isaac Newton, of all people. Uh, Isaac Newton's a very interesting character indeed, if people want to have a little look into him. Isaac Newton's well known in science as, as making some great discoveries in science, you know, some ground bacon, you know. Uh, and uh, Isaac Newton believed in a thing called the first principle. The first principle is God is the creator and he's created everything. And he's put, he's put laws, mathematical laws in place in his creation, in his universe. That's the first principle that he believed. This is, you know, people want to quote scientists. And he, he, his, his statement says, everything that I ever discovered in science was always an answer to prayer. The God of the Bible, not just God, but that he believed in the God of the Bible and he prayed and he asked God to show him stuff. God did. Uh, the revealer. So just a little side issue. But he... Uh, brought in milling. He brought in milling. So to stop these people shaving these coins around the edges, um, the Royal Mint got all the coins in. And like, if you've got a coin in your pocket now, it's got like a little ridge on the side of it. It's like a ridged, ridged edge. So he put a border on it. He put a border on it so you couldn't shave past the border because you'd, you'd notice it. And it was just something as simple as that. Anyway, that's just a little fact uh, about coins. Anyway, Second Corinthians uh, um, chapter 10. In verse one, here what's happened is Paul's Corinth was um, Corinth was really like you know if if you think about Amsterdam over there in Holland and what that's notorious for, infamous for, uh, Corinth would have been the Amsterdam of the day. Really, that's that's kind of what it was like. You know, particular problems um, with idolatry and idolatrous worship there. So you get the picture of where this place was. So he writes a letter to them. He he went there. He set them up. People got born again. He stayed there for a couple of years, and then he got off. Then he writes them a letter, and uh, he's correcting them. He's, he's correcting them. And it didn't go down. Some of the correction didn't go down too well with some of the members of the fellowship uh, in Corinth in the first letter. And then he writes them a second letter. So that's where we find ourselves. And uh, because he's having to correct them, um, he's meeting with some criticism uh, from certain individuals uh, within the fellowship. Criticism's okay. Uh, you shouldn't really, shouldn't be really too, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't shy away from true criticism. I worked on, a, I worked on the building and I had this fella, Joe, Greek Joe, and he set this, he set this course up, 
um, for health and safety where I had to drive. And he, he set it up and it took him a day and a half to set it up. And he said, go and drive around the course. I was the forklift driver in this massive site. And uh, so I went around and all this, you know, all laid out and I had to stop here and stop there. And he said, what do you think? I said, I said, do you really want me to tell you, Joe? And he said, yeah. I said, that'll take me three times as long to do the work that you want me to do that I can't do already. That's what it'll do. And he goes, well, the thing is, Dennis, he goes, eh, whenever you do something, you've got to be open to criticism. You know what I mean? And he had this really good view on it. Eh, I was just telling him, I was just telling him what, I, what I thought. But he didn't take that as um, eh, being bad or me being disapproving of him. He was open to criticism. Whenever you do anything, uh, you've got to be open to a bit of criticism. You've got to be able to open to advice on how you can do it a bit better. You've got to be open to a bit of advice if you're not doing something quite right. You know, you've got to be open to that. Uh, but there's a way of doing that. There's a, there's a way of doing that. That all comes under the words criticism, really, critique. So we wouldn't think that that's a bad thing. But here, uh, the kind of, the, uh, I think they're down the back of their hands <laughs> here, uh, criticising them. And um, it says in verse 1, Now I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ to be in presence and base among you and being absent and bold towards you. Uh, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with the confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think as us as though we walk in the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing, it into thought, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts himself that he is Christ, let himself think again that as he is Christ's, so are we uh, Christ's. So basically what they're saying is our... Uh, you know, you're judging after the flesh, Paul. You know what I mean? You're, 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 um, you're putting us under rules here. And uh, you're a Billy big head. You know what I mean? And you, you've made yourself uh, the, the, the chief judge, really. Uh, and Paul said, Paul, Paul acknowledges that, that, that he's got a nature. He acknowledges that. He said, but we don't war um, after the flesh. And the terminology he begins to use, it says, uh, um, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And really what it means is this. God's word, God's word is there. Yeah, I've got one here. Here's God's word, right? That's God. God's word, that, that's what rules. Yeah? And, and um, now, I can put my head of God's word. And I know what you say, Lord, but you stay down there and I'll have it my way. You understand? I put my, my thoughts, my judgment above God's judgment. And what he says is, when you come across that in yourself, knock your, chop your head off with you and get the, get the word of God back on track, become obedient, become subject. I shouldn't do that, should I? Uh, but that's, that's what it's talking about. Uh, and it's reasonings, reasonings that exalt themselves. I know the Bible says that, but I think this, and I'd rather go with what I think than what the word of God says. It says, cast them down. And you look into it, it means take a sledgehammer to it. And you're talking about something that you do inside yourself. You know what I mean? Figuring out, are these thoughts and are these ways and these plans my plans? Or are, are they God's plans? And, uh, yeah. Uh, it says, having the readiness to revenge all the disobedience when your obedience is, is fulfilled. So you start with yourself. Start with yourself. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about uh, take the beam out of your own eye before you take the mouth out of your brother's eye. So what he's saying is, he says, when you've done that to yourself, when you've been honest with the scriptures and you've got the Lord on top and ruling inside you, when you find that anywhere else, do it there as well. Do it, do it there as well. There's, there's, there's a thing, we, we, we saw it last week um, when, when we looked in the scriptures about, uh, does the Bible say that you shouldn't judge? Does the Bible say, that, what does that mean? Uh, judge not that you be not judged. Because when Jesus carries on to talk there, he says, when you've taken the thing that's in your eye out and you can see clearly, then you take it out of your brothers. Now, if we, if we are going to say that, that you can't judge anything, well, Jesus said you've got to be born again. 
of water and spirit, or you can't enter the kingdom of God. To be taken, we're not allowed to say that because now we're judging people. Everything you do is a judgment. Is this in accordance with the words of God or not in accordance with the words of God? And usually when people are saying, don't judge me, it means stop saying that. <laughs> stop saying that because I'm on the wrong side of it. And uh, I'll just show you just a few little examples. Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. So is Jesus really teaching his people that he doesn't want them to judge anything? Um, uh, Paul says, judge you what I say. And the Lord give you understanding in all things. It says, he that is spiritual, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, judges all things. And I'm just plucking these out, by the way. So it's, 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 um, it's really a bit lazy to say you, you, you can't judge, you shouldn't judge. And when we have the spiritual gifts, uh, two at the most three, it says, let the others judge. Let the others judge. So if we were just to use this scripture to say you shall not judge, you wouldn't be able to judge anything, would you? At any situation, where, where would that leave you? It displeased the Lord that there was no judgment, it says in Isaiah. It displeased them that, that, that people didn't judge. And um, uh, there's, there's a difficulty when, when people, what will people will do um, with the scriptures is they'll take one scripture that suits their, suits their mindset and fits in uh, with the way that they, they've already decided they want to go. Yeah, and then uh, I've, I've heard it say that if you, if you shoot an arrow, you know what I mean, at a target, it's like shooting the arrow and then going painting the target around the arrow of how accurate you are, how accurate you are. It's, it's bad form to do that with the scriptures. Um, it, it talks about, it says, study to show yourself um, approved. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that, that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth rightly dividing the word of truth and we do have to be careful you know how we handle uh, the word of god um show yourself approved is dokimos is dokimos yeah so when, when we're when we're handling the scriptures we have to be able to you know handle them uh, with the sense you can't just take one scripture and build whatever you like uh, out of that scripture um Paul goes on to say anyway, so they're saying, oh, you know what I mean? That's just you, that Paul. That's just you. And uh, later on, if you carry on reading in the next chapter, he says, uh, go and have a look at my spiritual CV. And he tells them where he was shipwrecked, whipped, beat up, thrown out, and all the rest of it, you know what I mean? He said, well, go, go, on, go and have a look at my history uh, before you think I'm, 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 I'm warring after the flesh here. Go, go and have a little look. And sometimes when you're getting two different accounts of the same thing, you've got, to, you've got to look at the character. You've got to look at the character of the people who are speaking. There's been a thing. I don't usually go for this, but um, something's had me attention this week in the Echo Online. And uh, there's two ladies. I won't mention them, but there's two ladies. And they're, having, they're in court. They're in court. And, uh, and what it is... They're both married to footballers. And uh, one lady um, has accused the other lady of, of leaking information, really. Leaking private information. What she's saying is, she's, she's saying that this, this, this other lady has no integrity. That's really what she's saying. That's what's in question in the whole thing. It's kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting thing. I don't know who's right and wrong. You know what I mean? I don't care either. You know what I mean? But the interesting thing is, from a distance anyway... One person actively shuns publicity. They don't want the, they don't want the, 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 you know, the newspaper people coming and sticking their camera in the window. It's the last thing they want. She only gets that because she's married to a famous man. Uh, the other person, uh, at every opportunity, she'll want the camera pointing at her and get on the telly for this and get on the telly for that. And it, you think, well, well, hang on a minute. We're getting a little bit of a picture here. It's starting to form you know, a, li a little bit of a picture of these two different, these two different um, uh, characters. And the clues, it doesn't prove anything, but you start, you, your scales begin to tip one way, don't you? You think, here's a person who just does this all the time, and here's a person who just doesn't, doesn't want it. And uh, then the husbands. So one of the husbands uh, was called to give testimony under oath. So he, he comes and he gives his testimony under oath. If you give your testimony under oath, you can be cross-examined. You can be cross-examined to find out whether what you're saying is true. 
So one of them stood up and he gave his testimony under oath in front of the judge and the, you know, the, the, the critic, the critic, if you like, well, you're saying that, but how does that work? You know what I mean? The other husband, he stood on the steps of the court, right? And he, he made his proclamations there where he cannot be cross-examined. He can't, he can't be cross-examined there. And one, uh, you have to, one is accountable and one is not accountable at all. So, so when you hear two different versions of the same account and you're trying to figure out, well, which one it is, there's a few little clues there that can help you uh, bring your judgment, or a likely judgment, you know what I mean? And uh, it was interesting uh, that the one, the one who stood up outside of this scrutiny can say whatever they like because they're not accountable for what they're saying. You know what I mean? Watch out for that. Uh, the problem, the, the people who were, the people who were um, giving Paul a problem, Paul's, Paul's wrote a letter in the first instance, and he, he talked about immorality, really, amongst other things, but immorality in the church. And he's saying you shouldn't allow immorality in the church because it devalues the gospel. It, it devalues the gospel. People will not believe the gospel if you allow certain behaviour uh, inside the church. It, it devalues the whole gospel. It devalues the guns. So it's detracted. It's detractors. The detractors are def trying to defend immorality. That's what the detractors are doing, you know. And Paul, his correction is to promote faithfulness. You know what I mean? Now you think about that. You think about that. And um, so which one is more likely uh, to be um, standing up for the Lord? And which one is more likely to be having their head ruling his book? You know what I mean? And uh, it doesn't give you all the answers. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. We'll finish here. Revelation chapter 3. Okay, we'll look at the seventh church, the last church, in verse 14. It says, To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness from the beginning of the creation of God. Uh, power to the people, basically, that's what it means, the church of the Leo Laodiceans. Let's be ruled by whatever's popular, popular opinion uh, of the day. You know, and that's the world that we live in. And that's the way Christianity's gone. If it's popular, it's in. If it's impop. If it's, if it's unpopular, it's out. You know what I mean? And at, the, at the moment, God's word is unpopular in a large part of Christianity, so it's out, you know? And uh, it says, These things say the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning uh, of the creation of God. He says, I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot, because you're because you lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's not very nice, Jesus. Surely, surely the Lord wouldn't say something as terrible as that. Eh? We heard this in the spiritual gifts. And it's, uh, it's one thing uh, or the other. The middle ground is the worst place you can be in any battle, isn't it? Uh, mixture. When we talk about the Babylon, mixture. Confused by mixing. Uh, mixing the metals. Here we go. Mixture again, hot or cold. Uh, because I say to you, because you say, you say, this is, this is a, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. I've got it all, yeah? And you know not, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So God says, that's God's judgment. And that's the church's judgment. Which one is correct? So from where they're standing, they're, they're all hunky-dory. Lord, Lord, you know, have you not prophesied in your name? You know, we've done many mighty works in your name. He says, I never knew you. Who's he talking about? I never knew you, he says. So, and, uh, and here he says, I counsel of thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment that you may be clothed. The shame of your nakedness does not appear and anoint your eyes with eyes of, uh, that, you, that, that you might see. You know, uh, listen, the, uh, the born-again experience 
uh, the water and spirit gospel that Jesus set up in John chapter 3, you must be born again, and the walking in the spirit uh, from the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and onwards is very, very rare. It's very rare. And when things are very rare, they're very valuable. They're very valuable. And we are coming up to the end of time. And you are not going to find uh, this, this doctrine being spoken in very many places. Compromise, compromise, compromise. And he'll say that that's better and it's bigger and uh, rich. And the Lord says, he says in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore uh, and repent. You know, if, if, you do not, if, you do, if you don't chastise your children, you don't love them. If you, if you, let, your, if you let your kids... Uh, break every rule and run, run riot, and you never say anything to them. That is not love. That that's not love. And you can find it throughout the Bible. Uh, God corrects those He loves. You know, correction isn't punishment. Correction is love. And uh, you know, the Lord nominates in the Scriptures what is to be corrected. Paul is correcting the Corinthians. That's what he's doing. He's not beating them up. He's he's correcting them. Uh, and he didn't he didn't like it. You know. Um. Yeah, no correction, no love. So be zealous, therefore. As many as I rebuke a chasing, you can read Hebrews 12 to go in with that. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and I'll sup with him and he with me. Uh, this, this scripture is in force today. Uh, to him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down uh, with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear uh, what the Spirit it says to the churches. Um, so it, it, it's just a, it's just an invitation. If, if you're here today, if you if you're not born, if you haven't had the born again experience, when we're talking about the born again experience, let's clarify what we mean. Behind the screen here is water. It's full immersion water. It's baptism water. And if you've been baptised any other way but full immersion baptism water by somebody who's got the Holy Ghost and somebody who's preaching a full gospel. It's not baptism, not Bible baptism. So you can be born of water today. Jesus said you've got to be born of water and the Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues every single one, every single time, according to the Bible, according to the Word of God. That's the born again experience. It's very simple and it's very clear. It happened to all the disciples. It happened to Mary. It happened to James. It happened to John. They're all filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're talking about here today, the born, again, experience. We spell it out for our visitors. We, if you don't know what that is, I'm happy to show uh, from the Bible. And what does he, what does he say? He says, uh, I'll stand at the door. If any man hear me voice and open the door, I'll come and I'll sup with him and he with me. So the Lord's ready. He's been ready for 2,000 years. And, and if anybody uh, wants access to the kingdom, uh, you just welcome the Lord in. And it's through the waters of baptism and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And from that point on, it's a new life. We leave the old rubbish uh, behind. We leave the old religion behind. We all leave the old bad ways, the bad conversation behind. And you walk in newness of life. And you're going to meet the Lord in the air. It's called walking in the Spirit. It's pretty simple stuff, actually. It's pretty simple stuff. Even our children know how to do it. Uh, you know? So that's the invitation, uh, you know, if you're here today, if you're hearing these things uh, for the first time, uh, you may. All the people said, Amen. Amen. Still off my soapbox there, Jay, at the end, you know what I mean? Okay. So we're going to have a prayer line now, according to the scriptures. Uh, let them call for the elders of the church, let them pray over them in the prayer of faith. Um, so we're going to have a, a time of prayer here. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to be baptized, if you, uh, you have a need and you want the Lord to meet it, Come in faith, come in faith, and uh, we'll pray with you here. We'll lay hands on you, according to the scriptures.